All of our productions at GCTV are sponsored in part by Bay State Health, providing the care you and your family need when you need it close to home. Visit them online at baystatehealth.org. Greenfield Savings Bank. Visit them at 400 Main Street in Greenfield. Call them at 774-3191 or go online to greenfieldsavings.com. Greenfield Community College, providing access and excellence in higher education in the Pioneer Valley. Visit them at gcc.mass.edu. The Hammond Family. The Hammond Family are longtime supporters of Greenfield Community Television. New Fortune Chinese Restaurant on the Mohawk Trail in Greenfield. Visit them online at newfortuneMA.com. Call them at 772-0838 and check them out on Facebook. Real Cleaning Services. Cleaning Hampshire and Franklin County since 1972. We don't cut corners, we clean them. Check them out online at realclean.com. Call them at 413-422-1143. People's United Bank, located at 45 Federal Street in Greenfield. You can call them at 774-3713 or visit them online at peoples.com. The Solar Store of Greenfield, replacing fossil fuels and nuclear power one home at a time. Visit them at 23 Fisk Ave. Call them at 413-772-3122 or visit them online at solarstoreofgreenfield.com. Thank you to our sponsors for supporting all of GCTV's productions. All right, now onto the fun part of the program, because our legislators always bring us such good news from Boston. <laughs> always good news. Uh, first, I would like to recognize Keith Barnacle, who is here on behalf of Congressman Jim McGovern. If you don't know Keith, you should introduce yourself to Keith, because he can make things happen, and that's a good thing. So the legislators have uh, given me their preferred order of speaking, and I'm just going to start with Senator Adam Hines, and you all can take it from there. Okay? Adam? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Jeez, it's hard to follow that act of speakers. Thank you very much, and thank you to Natalie. Um, this is a, an interesting time. I, I always feel like it, that Chinese curse is in the back of my mind. May you live in interesting times. Um, we, we've just come in from a, a pretty busy week on Beacon Hill. Um, but before I dive into that, uh, and I think what we'll do is each of us will take different topics so we're not being repetitive and, and we can give you interesting insights, hopefully, uh, from everything from recent legislation to the budget to pending legislation. Um, but right now, I, I'm, I'm coming here pretty optimistic about the region. And part of it is because you're looking out at a, at a landscape like that and it's a bright sunny morning. But it's also because it feels like as we move towards 2020, and this is increasingly a theme that I, I keep finding myself talking about, we're gonna have things like train service and train connection from the region down to major economic centers. We're gonna have, hopefully, fingers crossed, every single town in central and western mass lit up with high-speed internet. We're going to have, yeah. And a range of, of, of regional economic investments that you can point to uh, that, that say that, you know what, we're getting on the right foot, finally. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, but, um, and we'll talk about a few more initiatives that will contribute to that shortly. Um, and, and a part of why I'm optimistic is it's often a room like this where we're, we're very eager to lock elbows, look out for each other, make sure we're all thriving and doing well. Um, and that kind of leads me to today's one of my points of emphasis, which is the grand bargain that was struck on Beacon Hill this week, um, which you all are probably familiar with what I'm talking about, but it's essentially the a grand bargain that was um, the backdrop of which was multiple ballot initiatives, including $15 minimum wage, paid family and medical leave, reducing the sales tax, and then maybe on a, on a just off the table to the right is the, the fair share amendment, um, which was struck down um, Friday, was it Friday of last week? Um, Monday. Monday, okay. 
recently. Um, and so uh, maybe what I'll do is just take a few minutes to take you through the, the high-level snapshots of what that grand bargain looks like and, and what it might, um, how it might apply locally. And so it has passed the House and the Senate, and it's on the governor's desk. Um, and and it's, it's important for so many reasons. Uh, let's start with the $15 minimum wage, and that'll, that'll be implemented over five years, and so it'll be 15 by 2023. Um, and that's important because we really are leading the way there. And quite honestly, we're getting to a point where the purchasing power of folks earning a minimum wage will finally get to the point that it was in the late 60s. Um, now, as you might imagine, because we had multiple ballot initiatives on uh, at the same time, potentially, this is a bit like an old Western and everyone pointing guns at each other and standing there at a standoff because some of the trade-offs were, well, well wait a second, um, are you going to do things like reduce time and a half on Sundays? And so that was a part of the deal. Uh, which was a big, uh, big point for uh, regional chambers of commerce. At the table, I think you all know, were AIM, um, the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce, the Retailers Association, Greater, Shelburne, uh, Greater Springfield Chamber of Commerce, and others, um, and the, representing the business community. And then, of course, the Rise Up Coalition uh, on the other side. And it was led by the, the chairs of Labor and Workforce Development, House and Senate chairs. Um, and the result, by the way, of months and months and months of work. Um, and so th that's one, the second element, is the, the Sunday time and a half pay uh, would be phased out at the same rate that the $15 minimum wage is phased in over five years. Tax holiday. Um, a big, big demand for a lot of my retailers. We'll now have an annual tax holiday every August at a weekend to be determined. Um, I, I suppose by the legislature, but if they don't by July 1, then um, by the Department of Revenue. Uh, and so every year, an annual tax, tax holiday. That, by the way, impacts the, the budget by typically $25, $30 million every year, uh, but one that my Main Street retailers say is critical for them. And actually, I voted off um, supporting that uh, before this, this action just for that reason, the, the number of my local businesses who say, Come on, you're killing us. This is um, a way that we get people down on Main Street and, and um, into our stores. Um, so tax holiday. And as a result, the, the sales tax reduction from 6.25 down to 5 is not going to be on the ballot. I say this, you know, this is the commitment. We're all going to do, we're kind of watching to see how this, how this gets over the finish line. Um, so there has been a commitment to take that off the ballot. Um, paid family and medical leave. There has been a commitment to take that off the ballot if the following is, is um, implemented. And essentially it says something like, um, you can have 12 days of family leave and 20, excuse me, weeks, that's important, 12 weeks of family, <laughs> family leave and 20 weeks of medical leave. The share of who's paying the premiums is overall split about 50-50, employer, employee. But interestingly, and this was important for a lot of folks, if your business is, uh, employs 25 or fewer people, you're not paying a premium. So that's key. And there are, there are various other elements that I probably won't get into right now because it could take a long time, but of, of how, who's eligible, when that eligibility kicks in, et cetera. Um, and so the result of a, a, a long process. Um, what else should I mention on that? Um, you know, an interesting element that has now come into this, of course, is the Supreme Court decision that uh, online sales can be taxed. And so that is a huge, I don't know if you caught that, that happened yesterday morning. That is tremendous and, and, and very firmly in the category of how do we help our local retailers and storefronts. And so, interestingly, I think, and, and um, Steve Kulik can answer this probably better than me, we anticipate that contributing to the budget 200 to 300 million dollars or so. Um, pardon? Or the, I don't want to get ahead of this, but the governor is looking at that as well as this grand bargain. Um, and so I think we're all going to be watching what, how that impacts um, what comes back. Uh, so there's a bit of a to be continued, but there's a, there's a critical element here that, that essentially says, you know, we are forward leaning in the sense that. Um, I believe six states have paid family medical leave of some sort, and it is viewed as um, 
absolutely critical for creating strong families for the number of folks who are not able to take care of a sickness because they may not be paid or they may not have the job security. Those are the provisions that are alongside this. Um, and so I, I, I kind of alluded to the fact that there are a lot of ways to try to make sure we're not um, being, there isn't too big of a burden, particularly for small businesses. There are other elements like if you have an equivalent benefit, you will not be penalized and you can continue with that benefit. Um, that was key for some of my manufacturers, quite honestly. Um, and I see AIM shaking their head. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of, we left this week with a lot of people incredibly happy on both sides, on all sides, and a lot of people incredibly concerned and disappointed on all sides. Um, so typically that's a sign that something is, is going in the right direction. Um, and what's, uh, yeah, I know. Um, and, and what's important also is that when you look at the, the overall impact, um, and we're talking about somewhere in the nature of one million people um, experiencing movement towards a living wage and ability to pay the rent. And, and when you're in my position, in our position, Every single day, we're talking with people who are telling us stories about they have to have three jobs and they can't actually be there for their family and, and on and on and on. And so taking these steps and doing it in a careful, methodical way is critical. Oh, and by the way, with people standing behind you with guns to the head saying, if you don't do this, we're going to go ahead with our own ballot initiative, uh, which you don't like. And so this is, um, this is an important process that has um, just come in for a landing this week and to be continued. Um, and I'll let you all add any um, highlights and elements that you want as, as you're speaking. Um, I do want to close real quickly by saying, because I'm probably over my 10 minutes already, huh? No. I, I don't know. I didn't even check. Oh, good. Phew. Um, I just want to highlight a few um, highlights. This has been my first term, and, and we're, we're rolling into the, um, the finish line, and it, so it's a good time to check in, probably not a coincidence. Uh, now that we've finished the budget in both chambers and we're moving towards um, the end of the formal session, and um, a priority of ours has been, and this is really the whole Western Mass delegation, uh, has been trying to address these trends that Linda's been so good at, at pointing out in terms of Franklin County being one of three counties experiencing population decline, the other being Berkshire and Barnstable on the Cape, and, and recognizing the impact that that has had on things like the fact that our median household incomes are um, often 25,000 below the rest of the state. Uh, the fact that our health outcomes are behind, the fact that our education attainment is often behind. And as we're trying to right the ship, our basic infrastructure isn't even in place when it comes to transportation, high-speed internet, and the others. And so that has been an absolute priority. Um, and you can say that things like internet, um, especially because of the work of Stan Rosenberg, um, getting an, an additional 45 million before the end of last year, we're on the right path and we're constantly um, wrestling towns to the ground and, and finding that path uh, to finish that process. Um, and so that's the internet piece. The transportation piece, exciting pilot coming, as I mentioned earlier, for down the knowledge corridor, um, which could have tremendous impact throughout the region. Um, and another, th there are several others that we've worked together on as a delegation. I'm probably most proud of the Rural Sparsity School Aid, um, which came to us via Mohawk Trail and Superintendent Bonacani, um, and the Senate agreed there's something different. Not only the Senate, in, in last year's budget, we um, mandated that DESE develop a report on the fiscal conditions of our rural school districts throughout the Commonwealth. Surprise, surprise. In black and white, they say, you know what, it turns out schools are spending 50% more on transportation. They're spending more on um, teachers and paraprofessionals because of that dynamic of when a school, a, a child leaves, you still have to pay for the teachers, um, they, and on and on and on. Um, oh, but they notice, hey, there's, there's school enrollment decline in our rural schools uh, in the past 10 years, whereas it's been flat in every other part of the state. And so they, they went through and said, there are numerous ways we can try to address that, including increasing um, school regional transportation reimbursement and talked about efficiencies. Uh, and they also gave a nod to this concept of a rural sparsity aid, which we've seen in places like Wisconsin and um, one of the Dakotas, North Dakota, I believe. And um, it's kind of like, oh, somewhere out there. Um, <laughs> it's not here. I know, that's right. Jeez, I fell into the same trap. Um, and, and essentially what it says in a nutshell is that if you have 10 or fewer students per square mile and a per capita income 
that is below the state average, then you are eligible for additional funds per pupil. And we put the, the number at $100. And so that has a big impact in some of our schools. Mohawk will be in the nature of 100,000. And, and so the, the Senate agreed to put one and a half million towards that, one million of which will be in the four western counties. Surprise, surprise. Those are the, the, the school districts that are uh, eligible. And, um, and now we're, we're hopeful, hopeful that it can make it through the conference committee. Um, and we're all looking at Steve Kulik, who is one of the <laughs> six uh, most powerful people in the state right now because he's on the conference committee. Um, and, uh, and so there are, there are elements like that that make you think you have to be very specific about changing the dynamics in the county and be very tangible about translating that into policy. Um, and, and that's why it's been great to work with this delegation um, to achieve just that. Now, um, am I doing the next introduction? Okay, Representative, Representative Whips, please come forward and um, share your infinite wisdom with the, the group as well. Considering you're going to be hearing from the brains of the Franklin County delegation following me, I'm going to speak as the heart of the Franklin County delegation. And rather than talk about a lot of legislation that we've been working on, I wanted to talk to you about some of the other things that we and our staff do handle. And one of those is constituent services. I've got a, a great legislative aide. Steve and Paul and Adam all have wonderful aides and assistants in their offices. And a lot of people don't realize a lot of the work that goes on is one-on-one. -on -one. And a lot of it's private. And a lot of things, you know, we're out throwing fish in the quabbin. We're out doing a lot of exciting stuff. And that's social media acceptable. And we like to show that off. But a lot of the stuff we do, we like to handle privately. Um, and many people call us, and they don't call us when their cupboards are full and their houses are warm. They call us when they're in need. And there's a lot of different agencies that we help people out with. Um, DCF, people who need help with the RMV, um, towns who call us needing help with DOT work, um, people who call us because their state tax returns haven't come in, people who call us because an unemployment claim has been changed. Um, one of the most often calls I get in my office are um, parents who call me who have children who are struggling with substance misuse disorder. Um, those calls come often. They continue to come on a weekly basis. A lot of parents are raising grandchildren while their children are struggling um, with substance use disorder. One of the things we've been really fortunate in this area is the Franklin County Opioid Task Force, which Sheriff Donlin, um, District Attorney Sullivan, and our Register of Probate, John Merrigan, have worked to create this model that's being looked at across the state. We're light years ahead of what other agencies are doing as far as reducing the stigma, making sure people have access to treatment as well as re recovery options. Um, out in the North Quabbin area, we've got um, several different peer recovery organizations that have opened up. Um, Gamma, which is the greater Athol area, um, Mental Health Association has opened a peer recovery type home where people can come. It's on a beautiful old farm. People are allowed to work with the animals and garden, work with peers. And, and what we're finding is so many people who have spent decades in recovery successfully are now giving their time and reaching out to these younger folks who are new to recovery and being role models for them and showing that recovery does work and there are people out there who understand exactly how you're feeling. Um, the Quabbin Retreat opened in Peter Sam, Massachusetts recently. They have an intensive day program and they've also worked with McLean um, to create a residential program. They have 80 beds available right now um, at the Quabbin Retreat. And they're also working on phase three of their plan through Haywood Healthcare, which will provide an adolescent and young adult 
uh, treatment, residential treatment center, which is incredibly important and very much needed. We know that there's a, a need for beds, especially ones who are set up in a situation where they can um, work with co-occurring illnesses. It's not just important to treat the um, substance misuse disorder. It's really important that we look at the underlying issues that somebody might have and work with those mental health issues as well so we can get people into recovery. So I, I'm really proud and impressed with all of the work that has been done through there. Another thing my office has worked with Secretary Sutter's office on is um, Clean Slate had reached out to us about six months ago and told us that many health insurance plans require a doctor's referral before you can get medically assisted treatment. Um, we worked with Secretary Sutter's office and defined that as a huge barrier for people to get treatment. So they've, they've changed the requirements with Tufts Health Plan as well as Mass Health um, PPC to make sure that when somebody's ready for help and they go to an agency like Clean Slate, there's no need for a referral and they can start treatment right away, which is a huge leap over a barrier. We all know that there's a very short window when somebody's looking for help and to be able to get them to move on and get them in a program is really important. So um, I, I'm honored to work with this group. I'm honored especially to have leaders like Chris Donlin and Dave Sullivan and John Merrigan who have really kind of opened this up and it couldn't have happened without my colleagues, Representative Mark and Representative Kulik in the early days making sure there was funding for this. So we're on a really good path. I know Representative Mark has invited the chairwoman of the Mental Health and Substance Misuse and Recovery Committee to come out and sit down with the task force and learn and be able to share that with other organizations across the state. Um, we are leaders out here. There's a lot of things we do really well. And I'd just like to congratulate the OBIA task force as well as um, the North Quabbin Substance Misuse Task Force as well and all of the work they've done. This has been quite an epidemic. It's, it's taken a lot of lives. It's put a lot of families in difficult situations. And there's light at the end of the tunnel, thanks to all the people who have worked there. So I thank you for listening to me today. And I have the pleasure of introducing who next year, Paul Mark, who's a decade or more younger than me, will be the, the grandpappy of the Franklin County delegation with uh, Representative Kulik leaving us. So um, the OG is up next, Representative Paul Mark. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Referred to as the brains of the delegation. I thought it was the comic relief. All right. So we actually have a lot of changes. We're going to have a lot of changes in our delegations, and they're already happening. Uh, we've had uh, the retirement of Stan Rosenberg, the retirement of coming John Seibeck, the upcoming retirement of Steve Kulik, the unfortunate death of Peter Cocott, who I need to mention, was actually the lead on the bond bill amendment that secured the funding for the rail service that we're going to get next year. It was a team effort, but Peter Cocott was the lead on that. And uh, with all these changes, I'd be remiss if I didn't admit I have a confession to make. I almost left, too. I heard the president's call, and I was ready to heed it. <laughs> I went to sign up for the Space Force. <laughs> I went down to my local Space Force recruiter, and then I found out no lightsabers. <laughs> so I said, no thanks. I'm going to stick with what I'm doing right now. And I asked the uh, recruiter, I said, why, why a Space Force? What was the president thinking? He said, well, he was so used to people calling him a space cadet. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. Uh, thanks. <laughs> so last year, I was going to talk about redistricting. I didn't have enough time. So I'm going to give you the exact same presentation I had prepared one year ago on, on redistricting. As the chair of the redistricting committee, our charge at this early point in the game is to check for updates on the population, watch how the population is changing around the state, consider matters of law that might happen and might change the way we have to do redistricting, and then also to 
um, there was one of the, the census, to be prepared for the census, to be prepared for the U.S. Census and make sure that the count is done accurately and properly. And so in matters of law, I'll start off with that. Just this week we had a decision, or actually we had not a decision, come down from the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court was considering a case from the state of Wisconsin. And in Wisconsin, what they had found was that although 52% of the people who voted voted for a Democrat in the election, Democrats only won 39 out of 99 available legislative seats. So there's something wrong there. And they created a new term called the efficiency gap, that if 12% of people voted for one party, it would stand to reason that they would elect 12% of the seats. And they found there was not such a thing happening in Wisconsin and a couple other states. And so it was uh, at the district level and at the state level, the cases were, uh, the maps were overturned. And so it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court showed incredible courage by taking over a year to decide a way that they wouldn't have to rule on this. And they, changed, they, they decided instead of ruling on whether there is a political gerrymandering that goes too far or not, they sent back the case to the district court level saying that the plaintiffs didn't have standing after proceeding all through the levels up to the Supreme Court. And so now at the district court level, they will try to consider, is there a way the plaintiffs had standing or not? And standing means you have a right to sue. And the plaintiffs said, well, we're affected by this, and the Supreme Court is saying, no, you aren't. So there could be, there could be implications to that, that people who think they have standing in, in future redistricting cases will not, gerrymandering cases. So that was disappointing. There's another case pending from North Carolina. The Supreme Court has not decided yet whether they will or will not take it on, but if it does, it won't be till the next term, which won't start until October. Population data. So we've been watching the population data, and the good news is, in Massachusetts, we have growth. We have pretty good growth. And when you plug in the reapportionment formula, which is done by the clerk of the House every 10 years, there's 435 members of the House of Representatives, and that number does not change. It has not changed since 1920. But where the representatives go changes. And if we remember back in 2011, we lost a member of Congress. So the numbers show that we will not lose a member of Congress this time, which is Good news for the state. Uh, the bad news is Texas is going to gain a couple, Florida is going to gain a couple, and locally Rhode Island will probably lose a member, which will make them an at-large district. And these numbers not only affect our, our voice in Washington, but they affect also our voice in the Electoral College. And so states that gain members of Congress are going to have more of an influence on the Electoral College, and states like Rhode Island, who are local to us, are going to have less. We estimate that the population, the population in 2010 was 6,500,000. We estimate it'll be closer to 7 million by the time the 2020 census is done. In 2011, following the 2010 census, the average congressional district was 727,514. It looks like in 2020, the population for a congressional district should be 784,153, which means without anything happening in your district, you have to pick up 56,639 people, more than you had last time. So the bad news is out here in Western Massachusetts, our population growth is either slow, stagnant, or actually in decline. And so the prediction we have is that Congressional District 1 will need between 20 to 40,000 people in 2021. Congressional District 2, Keith Barnacle, will need between 10 and 20,000 people. So. That's not great news for us, because that means our, our, our members of Congress are going to represent bigger areas, and they're going to be harder to see. And they do as much as they can getting out around to see all of us, but here in Franklin County, I think especially, it's easy to be uh, overlooked, and we, we don't like that. We try to change that. So at the state level, our districts, our current districts, we, we can range within 5% of a base number, and so our districts range between 38,500 at the low end and 42,500 at the high end. We predict that that number is going to change to 42,005 at the low end and up to 44,005 at the high end. So again, if congressional districts are looking for people, that means representative districts are looking for people as well. And there's 19 districts right now that represent the four rural western counties. There's 19 just in the city of Boston. So we can't afford to lose any members. So this was what makes the census that much more important. So when the census happens in 2020, it is important that we make sure we all fill it out, that we encourage everybody we know to fill it out, and that we get engaged if there's events to try to promote census uh, participation. 
It happens officially April 1st, 2020, but it will happen throughout the year. And those numbers that we receive will be transmitted to the state legislatures by April 1st of 2021, so we can draw our districts and, and such for the House, the Senate, and the U.S. House of Representatives, and the Governor's Council. But the census affects all, a lot of other things, too. There's hundreds of programs at the federal level and the state level that are per capita, that are based on population. And in the climate right now, there are people that might not want to report. And that cuts across all party lines and all states and all demographics. We have to encourage them to do so. The COG has already held a census workshop, and I think there's going to be a lot more of that to make sure people understand why it's important and why they need to get out there. And I've heard some people talk about, because they don't like some of the questions that might be on there, and I don't like some of them either, they might protest and not participate. Do not do that. That is a bad idea. You aren't helping anybody. You're only hurting all of us. So participate and make sure your neighbors and your friends participate as well. And I just want to say on a personal level, we have a lot of changes coming to this delegation. And eight years ago, the people of this county took a chance on a 31-year-old kid who had never been elected to public office before. And I hope I've done a good job for you, and I hope I've delivered. But I want you to know that I've been practicing real good, and I've been watching my senior members, and I'm ready to take the lead, and I'm ready to make sure that we don't miss a beat. And I thank you for everything you've done for me, and I plan on doing it for all of you as well. And when I first got into office, nice segue into my introduction for the next person, I was told, you know, if you want to be successful in the legislature, pick like three or four people that you look, that you admire and that you respect and kind of do what they do and follow them and vote the way they vote and talk to them. And one of those people was my good friend and my neighbor, Representative Steve Kulik, who's given 25 years of service to the people of this region and this county and will be very sorely missed when we come back in January next year. And I don't have a candle for you, Steve, but <laughs> I, I, I want to say thank you and I want to introduce you and welcome you up to the podium to take your last legislative update from the Franklin County Chamber. Thank you, everybody. Well, thank you, Paul. You've been an excellent student, I must say. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to be with you once again. Uh, and this is the 25th time I've been to this legislative breakfast. Uh, Marion and I were talking as I was coming in. She says she remembers me uh, coming in June of 1993 when I was a brand new candidate uh, for this office in the first Franklin District, which had just been um, vacated by Jay Healy, my predecessor, when he became agriculture commissioner. So there was a special election cycle I announced for um, uh, representative on June 14th, and then a few days later was this breakfast. Uh, so, you know, the leg legislators at the time were up here. I was sitting out there soaking it all in and meeting people um, and uh, pretty nervous when I walked in the door because, you know, I live across the border uh, in Hampshire County, actually, and I didn't know very many people in Franklin County, but folks said, well, a good place to start is come to the chamber. And um, I didn't need to be nervous. Uh, people here were so welcoming and open and friendly and anxious to talk with me about uh, their concerns for the region, about their businesses, about their nonprofit organizations, about all the great things happening in Franklin County. And um, that relationship is something I have valued over the last 25 years. Uh, it's been a, a terrific experience, so I want to uh, thank you all uh, for your input and your inspiration and uh, the working partnerships we've had. So uh, that being said, um, I know I just have a few minutes left, but um, I, for the last 10 years, have been very active in the, as uh, one of the leaders in the House Ways and Means Committee, so my life has been focused mainly on budgets. And uh, the last couple of years, I've come to you and talked about very difficult budget challenges that we've been facing. Um, the last two years, we've had uh, revenue decline as we've been in the middle of our budgeting process. So uh, the, the House and Senate together and the governor, we've had to make budget cuts uh, as we were developing our budget. And I know that that has affected um, many programs uh, that, 
that serve Franklin County and the whole region. Um, this year, I come with much better news um, that revenues have been running ahead of benchmarks, uh, the, the, what we use to build our budgets on, and that's great. So I think we have uh, a little bit more robust budget that's before us right now. Uh, the House and Senate completed their work several weeks ago. Um, the budgets uh, have a lot in common uh, about uh, the amount of money they're devoting to local aid and to our local school districts. Um, they differ in some of the details and some of the policy initiatives that are contained in those budgets. And those are now uh, being conferenced by the House and Senate. As was mentioned, I have the privilege of being one of those conferees. So we're working very hard to try to complete our work uh, by the beginning of the fiscal year, July 1st. Sometimes it takes us a little bit longer uh, to do that. But yesterday, as a, as a uh, uh, guarantee that the state will continue to run smoothly, the governor filed a 1 12th budget so that uh, even if we're not finished uh, with our work, um, the uh, uh, government will continue as it is with the FY18 uh, budget levels for at least a month. So uh, it's going well. Um, we have a lot of new faces uh, in the conference committee, um, or a couple new faces this year, and um, we've, I think, established a really good working relationship. Um, not very contentious and all focused on getting this job done for the people of the Commonwealth. So um, with that optimistic news about the budget, um, I, I do want to mention uh, a little bit more about what Adam was talking about. Uh, and just say this grand bargain that he gave you a lot of details about um, is so important and I think I can't emphasize enough how good it is for the business community. Uh, it's good for your employees, for sure, for working people in terms of the paid family leave and the increase in the minimum wage. But I think it, it's also very good for businesses because I've heard a lot over the last couple of years as people have been out um, collecting signatures to put the three ballot questions on the ballot, one for the increase in the minimum wage, one for the paid family leave, and one for a reduction in the sales tax, that there was a lot of anxiety about there, that because I think we know that doing complicated public policy through the popular referendum in, a, in an election is not the best way to do it. You don't get the best details. You often get things that need to be changed later. Um, a good example of that was the marijuana uh, referendum of two years ago. We're about to go into that universe, but I think we're going into it much better on July 1st than we would have if we had simply followed the pattern that was in the ballot question two years ago. Um, the same can be said for these issues uh, that would have been very contentiously fought over on the ballot this fall. And from the business perspective, I know many, many small retail shops have talked with me over the years that they simply can't survive, for example, if they had a mandated family leave program, but they really wish they could do that. Um, they wish they could do it to retain their employees, to be able to backfill if an employee has a lengthy medical uh, uh, leave. And, and now they're going to be able to do that at a very nominal cost. Um, it's going to be a, a trust fund, an insurance fund, very much like unemployment insurance or workers' compensation. And as Adam Hines said, um, if you're a business of under 25 employees, um, you're not going to, as an employer, have to pay the premium, which is not pretty nominal. It's 0.63% of, of 1%, 0.63 of 1%, um, as a premium split between the employer and the employee. So, about half of that on each side. So I think it's a really fair um, agreement that, that does well for both um, the employer community and the employee community. No one got everything they wanted, um, but that's the essence of a good bargain after all. And avoiding, and, and I will say also, all three of those ballot questions were polling and the public polling very strongly that they were going to pass. Um, they all had between 60 and 80 percent popular approval. Um, now that's before millions of dollars would have been spent either in favor or in opposition to them. Um, but we're going to be spared all of that should this bargain go through to con and be um, consummated. So I think it's a, a really good thing for our region, for the state as a whole. Um, and we avoid the loss of $1.2 billion in the sales tax if that had been reduced to 5 percent 
which would have been re resulted in cuts to things like education and transportation and human services. So um, it is called a grand bargain. That seems a little pompous, perhaps, but I think it really is, and I think it shows um, that when we really uh, put our minds to it, the legislature uh, can do really good things uh, working with public interests um, as complicated as this. So I think I'm probably out of time. Uh, again, a thank you for your friendship and for your support over the years. It's been great working with you. I, will, you know, I have six months or so left in my term, so you'll see me again. Uh, but I just want to tell you how uh, valued this relationship that I've had with the Chamber has been, and it's been great working with all of you. I will see you again, though. But thanks a lot. Of our productions at GCTV are sponsored in part by Bay State Health, providing the care you and your family need when you need it close to home. Visit them online at baystatehealth.org. Greenfield Savings Bank. Visit them at 400 Main Street in Greenfield. Call them at 774-3191 or go online to greenfieldsavings.com. Greenfield Community College, providing access and excellence in higher education in the Pioneer Valley. Visit them at gcc.mass.edu. The Hammond Family. The Hammond Family are longtime supporters of Greenfield Community Television. New Fortune Chinese Restaurant on the Mohawk Trail in Greenfield. Visit them online at newfortuneMA.com. Call them at 772-0838 and check them out on Facebook. Real Cleaning Services. Cleaning Hampshire and Franklin County since 1972. We don't cut corners, we clean them. Check them out online at realclean.com. Call them at 413-422-1143. People's United Bank, located at 45 Federal Street in Greenfield. You can call them at 774-3713 or visit them online at peoples.com. The Solar Store of Greenfield, replacing fossil fuels and nuclear power one home at a time. Visit them at 23 Fisk Ave. Call them at 413-772-3122 or visit them online at solarstoreofgreenfield.com. Thank you to our sponsors for supporting all of GCTV's productions.